Are the Trump indictments all about justice or are they just a distraction from the Biden crime family values? That's going to be our Twitter poll today. If you want to vote in that Twitter poll, you're certainly welcome. But welcome first to the Lars Larson Show. Glad to have you with me. I want to talk a little bit about that Twitter poll, and then I'm going to get to the Biden economy, what Joe Biden likes to call Bidenomics, because I don't think Bidenomics is doing America any favors right now. But if you're a naysayer, you'll be, well, be, be, we'll be glad to put you right to the head of the line. That's all you got to do. We call this the best conversation in talk journalism. And you're invited to take part. If you want to dial in, it's 866-HEY-LARS. That's 866-439-5277. And if you're a naysayer, let's say you want to call the show and sing the praises of the Biden economy I'd be glad to put you in. Naysayers always go to the head of the line at 866-439-5277. You can send emails. Get a lot of naysayers who don't have the guts to actually call, who send me emails instead, giving me chapter and verse on why I'm so wrong about whatever it is they're writing about. And I'm glad for all those emails. Talk at LarsLarson.com. And you can vote in that Twitter poll. Are the Trump indictments all about justice, or are they just a distraction from the Biden crime family crimes? I would vote for Biden crime family crimes and distraction, but you can vote any way you like at Lars Larson Show and at LarsLarson.com. Brought to you by AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. AMAC has the conservative values I believe in, so I joined a long time ago, and you can too. It's easy. Just go to AMAC.us or call 888-262-2006. AMAC is better, better for you and better for America. Let me tell you what we've got coming up this hour, and then I'll get to the Biden economy. The Marine Corps seems to be one of the few examples where an American military branch is actually meeting its recruiting goals. And I think some of it may have to do with the fact that the Marines have, to some extent, rejected the woke nonsense that is being shoveled out of the White House. But there are some other things they're doing as well. Uh, From military news, they say the Marine Corps' unique approach to recruiting lately has contributed to their success in meeting recruitment goals while all the other military branches are falling short. The leaders within the Corps say they have made it their recruiting goal this year while the active duty Army, Navy, and Air Force are all expected to fall short. Brigadier General Walker Field says the Corps historically has emphasized selecting top performing Marines for recruiting jobs and expects to achieve its recruiting target of more than 33,000. Now you say in context, in relative terms, that's huge because every other branch of the military is falling short. And what the Marines have avoided doing, they have a number of people who've applied to be Marines. Now, my stepson was a Marine, so I'm, I'm proud of that. And I, I like the Marine Corps, America's first military unit formed before any of the others. Uh, but what some of the others have done is they said, we have to meet our goals this year. So we're going to go ahead and advance some of those delayed entry applicants. Well, the problem is... Once you start taking some of the ones who are planning to go in in six months or a year or longer than that, and you advance them to fill this year's goals, what do you do about next year's goals? You're really robbing Peter to pay Paul. The Marines are repositioning their recruiting stations. They're focusing on choosing the right recruiters. In other words, you don't use recruiting as a place to park a less than effective member of the military. You put your top folks in that position, men and women. I don't want to imagine in the Marines it's still men and women and not a bunch of pronouns. They have restrict, uh, resisted increasing bonuses to attract recruits. And you got to love what General Eric Smith said about that. He said, your bonus is you get to call yourself a Marine. Now, if the other branches are saying, why, we'll just bribe people. We'll just increase the bonuses by thousands and thousands of dollars. Are you getting the right people in to do the job, or are you just getting people who say, hey, it's worth a lot of cash, I guess I'll do it? That doesn't make any sense to me. Now, let me tell you what's coming up. Has the left's fixation on Ukraine left us more vulnerable than ever before to attacks by China or getting into a war over, say, Taiwan? Are the Trump indictments really about justice, or are they just meant to distract you? Because it seems every time there's a new development involving the Biden crime family, Immediately, you see another indictment of Donald Trump, as though all they've got to do is stack up enough indictments, and you'll forget about the fact that Joe Biden and his son were taking millions of dollars in bribes from foreign countries like Ukraine. 
And I'll have to give credit to Twitter. I saw this tweet, so I can't take full cre- I can't take any credit for it, actually. Uh, the the t- tweet was, though, and I love the way the man put it. I wish I could remember his name. He said, do you suppose if one of Donald Trump's kids had taken millions of dollars from a foreign government and Donald Trump was now sending tens of millions of dollars to that very foreign government, do you suppose the mainstream media would have been handling it just a little bit differently? And will Hunter Biden finally be forced to pay his unpaid back taxes, or is he still going to get continued special treatment for being the son of the president? And I want you to take just a moment to cast a vote in our Twitter poll. You'll find the question, brand new one, every day, at Lars Larson Show on Twitter and LarsLarson.com on the web. Now, a shout-out to our friends in Baltimore, Maryland, where they listen to Great Talk Radio on WBAL. That's AM 1090, and you can find my show there as well. I want you to consider what's going on in America's economy. And I also want you to consider one of the tie-ins I saw here. I, I, I'm a boring guy. So last night after I got off the air, I sat down, I read the entire Trump indictment. And you know what struck me most about it? The whole thing is about free speech. You say, no, 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 Jack Smith has charged Donald Trump with committing crimes. Well, what was the crime? The crime was, according to Jack Smith, in the indictment, because I read the whole thing cover to cover, the crime was that Donald Trump is alleged to have lied to the American public. Now, I've got a very simple definition of what a lie is. All of us say things that end up being untrue at some point, right? We all do. I mean, there have been times I've said to a friend, I think, you know, that's going to cost about $100. And then it ends up costing $200. Was I lying to my friend? No. I actually believed it was going to cost $100. You can think of mistakes like that you make all the time. I mean, Tina uh, last week said, hey, I want to stop by this store. I'm sure they're open. And we stopped by and they weren't open. Now, was Tina lying to me? No, she honestly thought the store was open. It turned out not to be. That's not a lie. A lie is when you tell somebody something that you know is untrue. So all the way through the indictment, as I was reading it last night, and it's dozens of pages long, I kept waiting for Jack Smith to tell me what was it? How is he going to prove that Donald Trump knowingly told things to the American public that he knew at the time were not true. You know how? Jack, and this is laughable. Jack Smith makes the case, well, people in the government told Donald Trump that it wasn't true. So he should have known it wasn't true. Do you know what? People in the government have told me that if you take the COVID shot, and Joe Biden's the guy who said this, among others, he said, if you take the COVID shot, you can't catch COVID. That is not true. Was it a lie? Well, it depends on whether or not Joe knew it at the time. And these days, given the state of Joe's brain, you can't tell what Joe knows from minute to minute. Coming up in a moment, we're going to talk about the Trump indictments, whether they're justice or just a distraction. Every time the Biden crime family gets closer to be found out, another indictment against Donald Trump. You're listening to The Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to The Lars Larson Show. It's a Wednesday. It's always my pleasure to be with you and a great pleasure to welcome back John Malcolm, Vice President of the Institution for Con- Institute for Constitutional Government at the Heritage Foundation. If anything, John Malcolm will be the one to set me straight if I've been leading <laughs> you astray on these tr- Trump indictments. John, good to have you back. It's good to be with you, Lars. I've been telling my audience that I sat last night because I'm a nerd and I read the entire indictment. You know, these four new charges that Jack Smith has brought down. And one of these days we've got to talk about Jack, Jack Smith's sordid history at the, uh, what was it? It's a government agency. It's called PIN, but it's in the DOJ and it has to do with it's personal integrity uh, section. Public, in- public, in- public, in- public integrity. Public integrity. You're, see, I knew, see, he set me straight already. And. The, the guy has a history of ignoring everything Hunter Biden and Joe Biden do. And then and then now everything Trump does is a crime, including, I've made the argument, free speech. Because Donald Trump ran around and said this election was not done right. He even did not public at that January 6th speech that was supposed to have inspired a riot, which didn't inspire a riot. But tell me this, is are we now at the point where people, including a president, can be can be indicted for free speech? Boy, you packed an awful lot in that statement. Uh, you know, one of the one of the real dangers, I think, of this indictment is uh, is the threat to 
uh, to free speech and also your ability to contest an election, petition for a redress of grievances if you're a non-lawyer, to rely on the legal advice of people, uh, uh, you know, of lawyers who are advising you. Uh, so here, the indictment claims, it begins actually by sitting there and saying, you know, president's got a right like every other American to contest an election, even if he's wrong about something, he's got a right to file lawsuits, got a right to demand recounts. And then everything that follows in the indictment appears to cut against that. So what the indictment lays out is all of these people who were close to Donald Trump or in the states who were telling Donald Trump, look, all these facts that you're saying about a stolen election, they're not true. And, you know, I, I have no doubt that there were a lot of people around Donald Trump at the time who were telling him that his allegations of, of a stolen election were simply false. I also have no doubt that there were a lot of people around him who were saying they're true and we will be able to prove this in court. I know that because I know some of these people. They believed it at the time and many of them believe it to this day. It is one thing for Donald Trump to be wrong. It is another thing to accuse him of lying. Uh, and here, if you're going to say, well, you know, you're, you're making these allegations, uh, but that constitutes a conspiracy to defraud the United States because you are trying to disenfranchise uh, people by contesting an election. Well, everybody then who questions an election or questions election procedures or engages in their free amendment, the First Amendment uh, speech opining about their views about an election uh, is in some jeopardy. And at the very late, least, this indictment has a dramatic chilling effect. Well, and John, I, I found a fun fact today that I'll throw into this discussion. Every single Democrat president has questioned the integrity of every election of a Republican to president since 1977. I mean, that's that's saying something, isn't it? You know, when you say, well, yeah. it's a crime to question an election, you go, hasn't every single elected Democrat president questioned the results when a Republican gets elected. And he says, yeah, that's happened for, uh, you know, since 77. I mean, we're talking half a century a tradition of Democrats questioning elections they don't like. And you say, well, that's a crime, isn't it? No, only when Republicans do it. Well, it's pretty extreme. There's no question about it. I mean, nobody suggested that Al Gore and his lawyers in 2000 should be uh, indicted for questioning the results in uh, in Florida. Nobody thought that the uh, electors in Hawaii in the 1960 election who showed up uh, to cast their electoral college votes for John Kennedy, even though at the time Richard Nixon had been declared the winner in Hawaii, nobody thought that they should be labeled as fake electors and thrown into jail or the attorneys who advised them to show up should be considered unindicted co-conspirators or indicted uh, co-conspirators in an election fraud scheme. Uh, this is a this is a less a far less clear cut indictment than the classified documents uh, case, and I think is is you know potentially very damaging. Well, let me ask you this: the timeline seems to suggest. I mean, it's coincident. It's either a gigantic coincidence that every time there's new bad evidence aimed at the Biden crime family, which is what I choose to call them, I wouldn't ask you to. Right. Um, that, that every time that happens, there's a new indictment against Trump. I think we're up to 81 or 82 at this point. I mean, is this how <laughs> it's going to go? And, and is there any reason to to believe when you say, oh, Jack Smith, he's a straight arrow? Yeah, except for all the stuff he ignored at the PIN. Uh, other than that, yeah, he just seems to bring want to bring new indictments every time there's exceptionally bad news for the Biden crime family. And and do you am I being too too conspir? Is my tinfoil hat too tight uh, when I say <laughs> I think there's a there's a tie between the two? Well, I don't know about that. I, I have no crystal ball on this. Uh, Donald Trump's lawyers, I believe, had received a target letter before the. Uh, the Biden uh, Hunter Biden plea deal blew up. But of course, even if the plea deal had gone through, that would have been bad news for the Biden. It was worse news that the plea deal uh, blew up. Uh, I was thinking of course, more of Devin now, Archer, but yeah, you know, that was, was scheduled say, as Devin well. Archer has come forward and Tony Bobulinski and Gal Luft, all of Hunter Biden's former partners uh, are talking about, oh, yeah, we were buying access and, and the then Vice President Joe Biden was all in on that. Uh, you know, I, I and the, the whistleblowers that have come forward, Joseph Ziegler, Gary Shapley, the IRS uh, agents. So it certainly, it's been a it's been a bad time uh, for the Bidens, uh, and I'm quite sure that they are very relieved that Hunter Biden is not the subject of today's news, but Donald Trump is. I'm talking to John Malcolm, who's vice president of the Institute for Constitutional Government and Heritage. So, John, you know, look, I was I was in high school when Watergate went down. 
But one of the things I remember, I, I thought if you were to describe Watergate today in generic terms, you'd say, well, one political party was spying on and, and trying to steal information from another political party, uh, and they did so with illegal means, uh, fairly mild illegal means, a break-in, things like that. And you go, oh, that, that stuff happens all the time. You go, and then there was a White House cover-up, and the cover-up is always worse than the crime. But this right. is talking about an American president who, if the FBI's apparently solid source is right, a president who took a $5 million bribe and in exchange for that, argued for and threatened to withhold a billion dollars in funding from Ukraine a number of years ago to get a prosecutor fired. That that makes Watergate look like nothing. It looks like n- absolutely nothing at all by comparison, especially if you think, are there people in Ukraine, people in Ukraine who now have compromising information on a president and they could say, hey, Joe, make sure another 10 billion shows up in Kiev or, uh, you know, people might find out about what you were doing over here. That's the reason. Isn't that the reason that the FBI was always worried about its agents getting compromised by gambling, by sex, by homosexuality or whatever? They always worried if you get the dirt on somebody, you own them. I think Joe Biden is owned by Beijing and Moscow and, and Kiev simultaneously. Well, certainly, if those allegations are true, you just mentioned uh, Beijing. I mean, you know, it, it's also been alleged that Hunter Biden, or it's not alleged, he, he's admitted that he did a lot of business dealings with uh, with companies, Chinese companies that were affiliated with the Chinese government. Uh, and there's no question, uh, at least Tony Bobolinsky has said uh, that uh, they were calling and getting uh, Joe Biden on the phone because all, the only thing that they were selling was the brand and they were selling access uh, and you know, pay for play scheme. That would put you in the pockets of bad people and give them bad information that they could hold over your head would certainly be a threat to national security, just as you outlined. Well, not just that, but John, where has Joe told us our energy future is? Is it at the bottom of a well in Texas or Oklahoma? No, no, it's in solar panels, windmills and batteries from China. And you say, no, well, that on. is true. Is it coincidental that the Biden crime family appears to have received tens of millions of dollars from CEFC and other entities in China? And now all of a sudden we're saying, don't use our own energy. Let's buy all this garbage from China. Well, you are absolutely correct that the lithium that goes into all of these solar panels and and electric vehicles uh, all comes from uh, from China. Uh, They put out all sorts of stuff about climate change and uh, blaming the United States when they produce more, when they open up more coal power plants uh, in a year than we have in the entire country. Uh, And certainly, you know, doing favors for the Chinese government is bad for national security. It is is potentially criminal if you've been paid to do it. And of course, late this afternoon, the New York Post broke a story that I guess Devin Archer shared with Tucker Carlson, a note he got from Joe Biden. Thanks so much for coming to the uh, luncheon with the Chinese, pri- at that time, Hu Jintao. And uh, sorry, I couldn't break away from Hu Jintao so I could spend more time talking to you. I mean, it seems like Joe was involved in his son's business oh, far more than he ever would admit to. That's John Malcolm from Heritage. John, thanks very much. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. It's a pleasure to be with you on a Wednesday. Always glad to take your calls at 866-HEY-LARS. Our Twitter poll today, and we put up a brand new question out of the news, news of the day every single day. Are the Donald Trump the indictments about justice, or are they just a distraction from the Biden crime family crimes? I would argue for a distraction rather than justice. I don't think there's any justice in this at all. And this ought to concern you. I mean, even if you're a person like me who never expects to be president of the United States or hold any public office, I never have, I never will, I still worry when the justice system, so-called, starts to treat people by different standards. Democrats can do things, Republicans cannot. If you're conservative, you may end up with a SWAT team on your front door, like the father of that young boy who was assaulted at a uh, a pro-life rally outside an abortion clinic, and dad ends up dragged off by a SWAT team for the crime of defending his son. And uh, the little old lady pushed back. He just gave her a pushback. And I think any mom or dad would have done the same. So when you have two systems of justice in a country that John Adams, former President John Adams, would say we are a nation of laws, not a nation of men, something is very seriously wrong. Find the Twitter poll at Lars Larson Show and at LarsLarson.com. Brought to you by AMAC. Join a great conservative group I've been a member of for years. Uh, go to amac.us or call 888 2006. Now, yesterday, I told you about a new law that goes into effect on September 1 in Texas. And what it says is, if you're driving intoxicated and you are convicted of intoxication manslaughter, that is, you kill somebody, 
if that person has children under the age of 18, you're going to be on the hook to pay support of those child, child, that child or those children until they turn 18 years of age. Should drunk drivers who kill the parents of small children pay child support? 91% of you join me in a yes vote on that. Only 9% of you said no. Now, I feel sorry for a woman, a woman by the name of Jana Samsonova. Now, she was a vegan influencer, which is why I didn't know her name before. She would go on uh, social media and talk about subsisting entirely on a diet of vegetables, fruit in this case. She was 39 years old. She literally died of starvation. And I wouldn't wish that on anyone. But this is how, you know, some of these fads that are out there, like deciding that you're going to just subsist on vegetables and fruit, Take a look in the mirror, look at your teeth, and tell me that you weren't designed to be a meat eater. That poor woman was 39 years of age. Zana Samsonova died as a result of starvation that she imposed on herself. Glad to get your calls at 866-HEY-LARS. That's 866-439-5277. Send your emails to talk at LarsLarson.com. I love getting a naysayer right out of the gate. Jeff is on the line. Jeff? Welcome to the program. Thanks for being a naysayer. Uh, what do you and I disagree about that makes you a naysayer? Well, I mean, you made the claim right off the bat that Democrats get to do things that Republicans can't do, can't get away with. It. And yep. I don't know what the heck you, you're talking about. I have could, could I give you some examples? Sure. Okay. Um, Antifa and BLM, between the two, did about $3 billion of damage to American cities. They burned, According they rioted, hold on, they burned, they rioted, they looted, they stole. There were at least 36 murders connected to their various peaceful, mostly peaceful demonstrations, as all the hair hats on TV news uh, like to call them. Now, you compare that, nobody gets prosecuted at all. I mean, very few, I shouldn't say nobody, it's not an absolute. There were a few people who got prosecuted, the vast majority of the people who engaged in that rioting, looting, arson, and, and even murder and assault got no prosecution at all. Then you look at conservative groups. A conservative group of people went up on Capitol Hill and many people got prosecuted for merely being inside a public building. Some did damage, some engaged in assault. I understand the prosecution there. Some of the people have been locked up without trial uh, since January 6th or shortly afterward of 2001. Does that sound like a dual system to you? Not really. Um, I think a lot Not of really? people that were on January Can I speak now? Yeah, please. I think a lot of the people that were involved in January 6th have not been charged with anything because they weren't major uh, offenders. I think they've narrowed it down to what uh, are the most, obviously the ones they can prove, but we're the most serious offenders. But not just that. Let's just look at the indictment. Have you read the indictment? The latest I, I, one? I said I said at the beginning of the hour uh, last night. I sat down and read the entire indictment front to back. So if we're on the indictment, tell me what you found in there in Donald Trump's free speech, in which the Justice Department says he lied. Tell me what the crime was. There was the free speech wasn't a part. wasn't a problem. It was, it was the center of the indictment. I mean, it, it outlines 21 well, separate... What, hold on, hold on, hold on, Jeff. It outlines 21 separate times that they say Donald Trump lied about the election, that he undermined people's confidence in the election system, and that, he was, and, that he was, and that he was lying. That's all true. That's all true, but that's really not illegal. You're allowed to lie. So but what did he... Well, so, tell, so again, I'll ask uh, you the question where again. What, the what did, where did he commit the crime? Read... Read the thing fully. I don't, I, I'm driving right Jeff, now. So I, don't I read, really have it I read the entire indictment, Jeff, oh. front to back. And believe me, I read it with okay. a critical eye. I didn't read it like a magazine uh, article. I, I read it. I think you read it with a critical eye towards your agenda, not. No, in, I'm just asking. I, I looked for the crime in there. And here's the other thing, Jeff. Can we agree the on what. Very specific what the crimes are. He no. tried to defraud you, me, and everyone else of our vote. Well, but hold That's on a second, the Jeff, Jeff, thing. Jeff. That is the primary crime. And, 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 that, and that the, the, the argument they made that he defraud, defrauded people was by telling them your vote was not counted accurately. Do you believe that no. all the votes in November of 2020 were counted what, accurately? What, were the, the, what about the, the fake electors and all those that were done in the seven states? 
there were five different avenues for this. Didn't you watch the January 6th hearings uh, did, put on? Did, by, did, did, by, did you hear? The, uh, did you hear? Hold on, hold on. I want to ask you. To I your mean, point on the is, fake this electors. This all well known. You should did be you, more well informed. It's not. Uh, I'm very well informed. John Malcolm from uh, Heritage. You, yeah, hold on, John. John Malcolm. Hey. Let me finish. John Malcolm from Heritage, who was just on, said, for example, oh, there have been a, there have been other elections where people organized to become electors in place of electors. He gave the example of Hawaii. Hawaii uh, had electors who were the the official electors, and then there was a slate of electors that could be said to be the same fake electors. What's the difference? Tell me about that. I'm not I'm unfamiliar with that. So what was that? You when weren't did that listening happen 10 minutes who ago? Was involved? Okay. I, I just got in the truck and okay. turned you on the radio, okay? Well, I appreciate that. And I'm that. on my way to a function, but I immediately it disagreed with what you're saying here in my local town where, where we're he, already he, too right-wing he, as it is. We no, don't need more of this gasoline is, thrown on the tell, fire. Can you tell me what too right-wing is? Because I don't know what you're meaning. Well, my parents were Republicans. There was a time when I was a Republican, and I was interested in making and reasonable a progress on lots of fronts. Yeah. So what you, how, how would you describe yourself today? How would you describe now. yourself? I'm, are you, are you, well, Jeff, you may not have heard, are you aware that every... I would every, describe myself now as a liberal. The older I've gotten, the more tolerant of others I've become, and the more understanding of how the world works. Oh, you mean the tolerant that's crowd, my, hold on, Jeff, let experience. me test that tolerance. You mean the tolerant crowd that says, if as a Protestant Christian, I don't believe in, in gay marriage, that that's the crowd you're going to describe as tolerant to me? Please tell me about their That's tolerance. That's not my crowd. I, I don't care if anybody wants to get married. And I don't care what sex they think they are. I think that's their own business, and I don't really give a shit. I think women well, should have the you right. know what? Drump the call. He just dropped the S-bomb. And you know, when you drop the swear words, I'm sorry, the FCC will find the daylights out of me. Thank God I've managed to avoid that my entire career. But, Jeff, you were good up to that point, but then you dropped a swear word. Coming up, Hunter Biden blew off the IRS while he made millions. Will he be forced to pay his unpaid taxes or get more special treatment? We'll talk about that next. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I kind of talked earlier about a double system of justice, a dual system of justice. Now, I pay the IRS every single year. And uh, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, I, I owed them some money and I didn't have it to pay. And so I worked out a payment plan with them. I'm not ashamed to ad- admit that. In fact, I advise everybody, if you owe the IRS some money, get on a plan, you know, agree to pay it or dispute it if you believe you don't honestly owe the debt. But in Hunter Biden's cases, a case, I think he just basically ignored it and said, I'm just not going to declare my income at all. And he did this for a number of years. And then he had carved out what he thought was a deal that was supposed to be made, uh, made final in a Delaware courtroom until the judge threw it out and said, I'm not rubber stamping this nonsense. But it was going to make him or you know, acknowledge that he had paid the taxes he had owed for years. Uh, he had paid back the money he owed for a couple of years, but it was going to ignore a lot of other monies that he made that was somehow going to be swept under the rug. And that sounds like dual justice to me. Grover Norquist is president of Americans for Tax Reform. Grover, welcome back to the program. Absolutely. Good to be with you. Uh, is he ever going to pay his back taxes? Uh, he has no intention of it. Uh, it is a little bit odd because his father, Joe Biden, was running around planning to raise hundreds of billions of dollars on ta- of taxes on all Americans, raising taxes on energy, which would hit all Americans. And he poo-pooed criticism that how this would hurt the economy because, you know, people, it's patriotic to pay taxes. Uh, and it's patriotic to pay more taxes and taxes that he wants. That's what patriotism is, is giving him money. Uh, uh, to take that attitude or claim it and then to look the other way, Biden's been a, is a rich man. His son made him a rich man. He could have paid the son's taxes. The son has money to pay the taxes. He chose not to. So this idea that the rest of us need our taxes raised, and if we complain about how the government wastes our money or suggest it's not a good idea to raise taxes on all Americans and their energy. We're bad people, but his son paying taxes is optional. We had a revolutionary war against this European idea that some people are aristocrats and the king 
can do anything he wants and the aristocrats can do anything they want. And there's a different rule for them and everybody else. And Biden and company think they're aristocrats and the laws don't apply to them. There's something else that I don't understand. Maybe I'm missing something big, Grover, but how is it that the deal was going to let him pay his taxes for 2016 and 2019, but not, not the in-between years? That, that one struck me as kind of strange. And I wondered whether or not there was a tie to where those middle years lead to as opposed to the end years, 16 and 19. Is, am I suspect, do you think I'm right in my suspicion that there was a reason they didn't say, well, you'll pay your oldest taxes or you'll pay your newest taxes or you'll pay the taxes for the year in which you made the most money and owe the most taxes? No, they did this weird straddle. Is there a reason for that? It, I think you pointed to the only uh, likely reason. I, I was always told as a young person that, you know, if you made some mistake or something, they could go back seven years and yell at you. But if you deliberately hid income, that they could go back 100 years, right? There was no protection, no time limit. There is for murder, you know, for other crimes, but not, not IRS. They could go back forever. But seven years for mistakes, right? right. Um, but he didn't make a mistake. Then he's not claiming he made a mistake. He deliberately did not pay taxes. He deliberately uh, misled people as to what he owed. And, um, and there is no reason why he shouldn't have been required to pay the taxes for all of those, except for what you're saying. They don't want you looking at certain things. The other one that strikes me as odd is he wanted to be let, in, in a case about not paying your taxes, he wanted the judge to say, and nobody can ever prosecute you for a series of other crimes, including Foreign uh, Agent Registration Act, which was put in, I think, between World War I and World War II because people were getting paid by other countries to lobby the United States. And the American government says, you, you can lobby for another country if you want, or a company for another country, but you have to let the world know that that's what you're doing when you walk in to see a congressman, that you're not just there, hey, I'm, I'm your friend and I'm lobbying for, you know, some France. Uh, and they have very stiff, 18 years is what I was always told for, for violating that. People are in prison today for representing companies in the breakup of Yugoslavia and you wonder whether they had any idea what they were, you know, doing something wrong. Um, but you go to jail for it. It's a very serious thing. And that's one of the things they were going to say. We won't, anything, any crime that may, I think if you were going to ask for a crime to be pardoned or ignored, you'd acknowledge it, right? Yep, <laughs> yep, like, you have Here's to. the three things I did. <laughs> yeah, I would think, but this was a blank check as in, it is so bad, we can't write it down, but we want the government to agree never to, and if you can't charge somebody on it, you can't then force them to divulge what it was. This was to shut down any real investigation. Uh, it was to let Biden, the, the whole Biden family, keep a lot of money that they didn't really earn. Um, this is just really frightening. And you know, people are going, I wonder if uh, Trump is going to be able to keep going given the new indictments. <laughs> um, let's see. It'll be a fundraiser. Anybody ask, <laughs> is anybody asking that question about the Biden? Uh, how do you continue uh, unless, you know, they shut this whole thing down in a couple of weeks and Garland is able to Garland, right? This is the guy that the, the, yep. the, that the left put up under Obama. He was going to be on the Supreme Court and the establishment. Oh, he's such a moderate. Amazing that Obama <laughs> put that moderate nonpartisan <laughs> guy in like the Republicans were supposed to be so stupid as to listen to the New York Times. Oh, OK, if it's not, if he's that like, we'll give him the job. And they were so unhappy when he didn't get the job. I am so glad when we find out what a political partisan hack he's been. The, he the lack of respect for the rule of law. He's the, head of, he's the attorney general. What if he'd been on the Supreme Court for life? No, that'd be frightening. And the fact, the biggest concern I've got, Grover, is the compromise of an American president. The FBI used to not hire gay people. Why? Because they said, if somebody finds out you are, you'll be compromised. You might be caused to do things you wouldn't do otherwise but at the threat of being outed. I think there are people in Ukraine right now who could out Joe Biden in a heartbeat. And I think they've communicated that and said, uh, you will be doing some things for us. 
President Biden, because if you don't, the whole world's going to find out. Zlochevsky claims to have these uh, these recordings, you know, that, that would immediately out Joe Biden. Imagine what a compromise that is to have an American president who's bought and paid for, and he knows he could be outed in a heartbeat, and he'd end up spending the rest of his sad, miserable life. Instead of sitting on the beach at Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, he'd be sitting in a federal pen somewhere for those kind of crimes. And, of course, the only people who can bring charges against him would be Merrick Garland over at the DOJ, the highly competent, highly ethical Merrick Garland. That's Grover Norquist. Grover, thank you. Why is there a secret, undisclosed, and illegal Chinese-owned biolab in Fresno, California? I know, I wish I had the answer to that, but I'm glad to talk about what we do know about what's going on in Fresno, California at a warehouse. I'll give you all the details that I have. First, welcome to the Lars Larson Show. Glad to be with you and always glad to take your calls. It's a Wednesday. Uh, We are the best conversation in talk journalism, and you're invited to take part at 866-HEY-LARS. And if you're a naysayer, we'll put you right to the head of the line at 866-439-5277. Send your emails to talk at LarsLarson.com. And I would imagine that the Donald Trump indictment that came down late yesterday, talked about it a bit last night, is going to be on your mind as well. That's also on our Twitter poll, and you're free to vote in that. Uh, The question is, at least the question, the way we framed it, there are lots of questions you could frame around these most recent indictments. Like, can you really be prosecuted and thrown in jail and potentially, believe it or not, face a death penalty for engaging in free speech? Because that's what Jack Smith, the special counsel, has accused Donald Trump of doing, of talking. He's accused him of talking about an election and saying things about the election that Jack Smith says are absolutely untrue, and Donald Trump knew it when he said it. Oh, hold on a second. I still believe that there are questions about the 2020 election. I still believe that the 2020 election was not legitimate. Does that make me unusual? I don't think so. In fact, the history in American politics is that Democrat presidents have, since 1977, questioned the outcome of elections and suggested that they were illegitimate when Republicans got elected. So if questioning whether or not a, an election is legitimate or not is a crime, you're going to have to arrest a bunch of former presidents who all have a D in front of their name. So are the Trump indictments about justice or are they just a distraction from the Biden crime family's crimes? You can find the question at Lars Larson Show and at LarsLarson.com. is brought to you by AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. AMAC has the conservative values I believe in. I joined the group a long time ago. You should, too. Just go to amac.us or call 888-262-2006. AMAC is better, better for you and better for America. There is so much to talk about. But about this Chinese-owned biolab in Fresno, California. Now, I know that some of you have not heard about this. The news actually broke late last week. And I was curious about it because sometimes, I'll be the first to admit, I don't try to jump on something right away. I want to jump on it after I've got just a little bit of information about it. Now, there's been a bit of national news coverage, so you can't say the national news media has not at least looked at what's going on in Fresno, California. But what did they find? Well, somebody noticed a garden hose that was hooked up outside a warehouse that appeared to lead inside. And they thought, that's kind of strange. Nobody appears to be in that warehouse. It doesn't have any tenants. But it did have a tenant. And who's the tenant? A Chinese-owned company. And what was inside? Well, when the authorities were alerted, they went into this warehouse in Fresno, California. And according to NBC News, they found a bunch of animals. They found a bunch of mice in particular, apparently mice that were genetically engineered to be uh, fast-growing. Okay, so lab mice are generally bred so that they're all roughly the same because then when you test something on them, you know the test that applies to this Norway uh, rat or this mouse is going to turn out the same way with all. You know, that's how you get consistent results. They found 773 living mice and about 175 dead mice inside this warehouse. They also found medical waste. They also found hazardous materials. And what makes it really crazy, the Centers for Disease Control showed up and tested what they found 
inside this warehouse, in all this medical gear, medical samples and all that, they found at least 20 different potentially infectious agents, including coronavirus, HIV, hepatitis, herpes, the, the list goes on and on and on. So Health and Human Services talked about all of this. Now, the investigation by the government found out that the tenant who had rented the warehouse is known as Prestige Biotech. Now, the company is registered in the state of Nevada, but is not licensed to do business in California and is owned by a Chinese company. And city officials in Fresno, and believe me, we've reached out to them. I'd love to talk to the city manager who's quoted. They reached out to Xingqing Yao, I think that's the pronunciation, identified as the company president, got emails back in response. The officials were unable to get any kind of California-based address for the company except for the previous Fresno location, which was occupied by a different company. And what Prestige Biotech is They say, we just bought the assets of this other company that went out of business. They got evicted from their previous location. The other addresses provided for identified authorized agents were empty offices or addresses in China that couldn't be verified. So I know you might think my tinfoil hat is too tight. When you find an illegal, unlicensed lab full of lab mice, medical waste, hazardous materials, samples of 20 different infectious agents, you got to wonder, what is China up to? And why would I ask that question? Well, as you know, it was a Chinese bio lab that created SARS-CoV-2. I know we were told that was a lie way back in the day, but it turned out it was absolutely true. Everybody today seems to agree, yep, probably came from there. And the only reason you believed otherwise is because Dr. Anthony Fauci wanted to hide the truth from Americans. So he talked some of his scientific friends into writing up some papers that debunked the whole lab leak theory. Said, no, no, it came from the wet market or some kind of bat out in the forest somewhere. No, now we know to a fair certainty that that virus actually came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which common sense would have told you was the most likely result. In any case, secret biolab illegal in California, and nobody's explaining. I also want to ask you this. Is the CDC trying to make you a COVID vaccine customer for life? Now, I'm calling it a vaccine just so you know what I'm talking about. I don't really don't think it's a vaccine. Vaccines keep you from getting diseases. I mean, my own doctor has told me, hey, Lars, that measles shot you got more than 50 years ago is still protecting you against measles today. I can't get measles. But in the case of SARS-CoV-2, you take the jab. Does it stop you from getting COVID? Well, Joe Biden said that. He said, if you get the shot, you can't catch COVID. Well, that turned out to be a lie, too, but Jack Smith isn't proposing that we prosecute Joe Biden for telling the American people lies. But now the new director of CDC says her agency would like to come out in a couple of months in the fall this year and tell everybody you have to get an annual COVID-19 booster shot. We're right on the precipice of that, she said. So I don't want to get ahead of where our scientists are going. Oh, that's right. Follow the science because that's done us so much good over the last three years. In any case, glad to have you with me on a Wednesday. Always glad to take your calls. A shout out to our friends in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where they listen to great talk radio all day on KZIM, K-Z-I-M. That's AM 960. And you can find my show there as well. It's actually Rush Limbaugh's hometown, although I don't think he ever worked at KZIM. Coming up in a moment, Saudi Arabia plans to host peace talks on the war in Ukraine, which exclude Russia. Is that ever going to have any impact, or is it just a ploy to isolate Russia? We'll talk about that coming up next on the Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I'm always glad to get to your phone calls and your emails. Of course, we've got the war going on in Ukraine. We've got tens or hundreds of billions of dollars of American taxpayer money going to Ukraine. We seem to be emptying the warehouses of our bombs and bullets to help out Ukraine, even if it weakens America. And now there are peace talks planned uh, on Ukraine, but they don't involve Russia. And I want to get George Beebe to explain that to us. He's the former director of the CIA's Russia Analysis Department and former Russia advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney, currently director of Grand Strategy at the Quincy Institute. George, welcome back. George, are you there? Hang on just a second. What the heck? George, are you there? Got a little problem. I don't know. Let's see if we can get him lined back up on another line. 
The bottom line is Russia said it will closely follow the Ukraine peace talks hosted by Saudi Arabia, even though it was not invited to the discussions. Well, that seems to be a little bit of a problem, doesn't it? If you've got two warring parties, Ukraine and Russia, and you want to have peace talks, don't you have to have both of them at the table? I mean, I'm no foreign policy expert, but it seems like that would be required. George, are you there? I am here. Okay, so tell me, what what do you have when you have peace talks and one of the two parties is not at the table? (laughs) Well, those aren't peace talks. They're something else. I'm not sure what you would call them, but... If you're going to have talks about a settlement, uh, all the parties that are involved in the conflict need to be a a part of that. So they've got everybody at the talks, officials from 30 different countries, the U.K., South Africa, Poland, the EU, even the U.S. National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, I don't think much of him, are all expected to attend. India and Brazil are also invited as well, but not Russia. Then what's the point? I mean, what are they trying to do with this if it's not actually get talks to maybe end uh, what's going on in Ukraine? Well, I think this is uh, another part of a a longstanding effort on the part of Ukraine and the United States to rally international support for Ukraine, uh, to bolster its own position on the battlefield and in any potential future negotiations. So it's a Um, fundraiser. Well, it's, (laughs) it's more of a... It's more of a, you know, a diplomatic support exercise. But? Well, um, I'm not sure it's going to be any more successful than previous efforts have been in all of this. The Ukrainians have put forward this 10-point plan for ending the war, which is basically terms of Russian capitulation. You know, the Russians end the war. They abandon all territory that they are now holding in Ukraine. They have to pay reparations. Russian leaders are carried off to The Hague for war war crimes prosecution. Those aren't terms of compromise or settlement. Those are terms of capitulation. So they have not gone anywhere to this point, and I don't think they're very likely to go anywhere, particularly if Ukraine is not able to perform more effectively uh, in its counteroffensive, which right now is uh, struggling. it's, it's bogged down, isn't it? I mean, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be producing much in the way of results. So it's not exactly like they're on the deck of the battleship in 1945 in Tokyo Bay, are they? <laughs> no, I think we're a long way from that. Uh, and uh, right now, Ukraine's plans and American plans for ending this war are premised on success in this counteroffensive. So uh, the fact that the counteroffensive is, is going poorly uh, suggests that we need to be thinking creatively about an alternative way of ending this war. Well, do you mind if I go back to about the time the war began? Was What should I make of reports, and I've read reports one direction and the other, that said that Israel and other countries had negotiated something that sounded like it would have headed off the Ukraine war altogether. Are there parties involved in this, and maybe even the United States as well, who want this conflict because they think it'll settle some other issues? Well, uh, yeah, I think that's probably true. I think uh, some U.S. officials have, have uh, on occasion said some things like, uh, we want to see Russia's strategic defeat. We want to weaken Russia economically and militarily so that it's not capable of, of doing this sort of thing in the future. Um, and there are those who speculate that back when Russia and Ukraine early in this war, were negotiating uh, a compromise settlement uh, that the United States had said, no, it's not time to end the war yet because Russia is not yet sufficiently weakened. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. We can only speculate. But uh, it is, I think, a fact that uh, Russia and Ukraine <clears throat> were uh, earlier <clears throat> excuse me, in this conflict uh, seemingly close to some terms of of a compromise and those talks then broke off and uh, have not resumed in in uh, over a year since those initial uh, negotiations now whether ukraine and russia can get back to some sort of compromise or not one can only speculate about but i think it's going to be harder now because a lot more lives have been lost and, and there are a lot more stakes Uh, in play for both sides.
I'm talking to George Beebe from the Quincy Institute. Well, this is troubling to me as an American citizen because I, I'm glad I'm not the only person who's heard and read that, that there, there was a way to avoid this. And it sounds like when the two parties were close, the U.S., among others, pushed them back apart and said, no, we want to have a war. We've got, other, we've got another agenda we want to achieve. Wouldn't that be significant to the American taxpayer who's funding the majority of this? Well, I think if that were the, in fact true, it would be quite significant. Uh, there, there is a lot at stake in this war, uh, a lot for the world as well as for Ukraine. Uh, and of course, it is a very dangerous conflict because we're talking about potential escalation into conflict between the world's two largest nuclear powers. So yep. it's a very dangerous thing. And I think uh, the American people need to be thinking very hard about uh, the dangers that we're in right now and uh, thinking hard about how we get out of the situation that we find ourselves in. Well, and let me ask you this, Mr. B. I'm talking to George Beebe from Quincy. So the American people are told there's a war. Russia's done this. There was no way to avoid it. Joe Biden, it sounded like in February of last year, almost invited it, saying, well, if it's a small incursion, uh, maybe maybe we won't have to do that much. And now we're being told, no, we've got to ship huge amounts of arms and ammunition, and we've got to ship uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars into a notoriously corrupt country for a war that could have been avoided and that we we helped to engineer. Because that makes me want to go back to the Maidan revolution and say, what, wasn't Obama involved in sort of engineering? The, the country's always been a little bit of a ping pong ball between Russia and the West with, you know, Russia wants the government to be pro-Russia and we want them to be pro-West. And, and we've done that. How much of this is our fault for having created that situation and then said, we want this situation to continue till certain things happen to Russia and damn the consequences? Well, I think the decision to invade Ukraine uh, falls on Putin's shoulders. He didn't Agreed. have to do that. He was not attacked. Uh, it was illegal under the terms of the UN Charter as a result. That said, the conditions that uh, led to Putin's decision to do this, the United States certainly had a role in helping to create. It wasn't exclusively our fault. This was uh, uh, conditions that, that Russia contributed to, uh, as well as the United States. But we were in, in an, uh, effect in a tug of war over Ukraine's geopolitical orientation. The United States was trying to pull Ukraine into the Western orbit, and Russia was attempting to resist that, uh, to prevent that from happening. And that was not a situation that was going to have a happy ending for anybody. Um, it was clear that uh, if the United States tried to pull Ukraine into the Western orbit, into NATO, that the Russians were going to fight back and that Ukraine was going to suffer in the process. And it was also clear that if the Russians attempted to pull Ukraine exclusively into Russia's orbit, that there was going to be resistance inside Ukraine to doing that. It sounds like the only sensible place would be to have them stay neutral and play Switzerland in between. That's George Beebe from the Quincy Institute. George, thanks very much. You're listening to The Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to The Lars Larson Show. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I'm glad to take your phone calls and emails at 866-HEY-LARS. Hey, do you like to shoot? Do you like to shoot guns? Do you like to go out and, and engage in archery, you know, bow, bow hunting or just shooting at targets? I want to bring this up because I want to show you how broad-based the Biden administration's attack on American freedoms is and how they're trying to control what people are involved in, including your kids in school. But first, welcome to the Lars Larson Show. Glad to get your calls. If you'd like to join what we call the best conversation in talk journalism, it happens right here every single day at, at uh, 866. Hey, Lars. And if you're a nays here, we'll put you right on right to the head of the line at 866-439-5277. Send your emails to talk at LarsLarson.com. So the Biden administration, according to Not the Bee, the Biden administration is deliberately blocking funding for any school to have its own archery, rifle, or hunting program. And they're doing this because of what they call an interest in school safety. 
according to this federal guidance that's being sent out, let me tell you what guidance means. You know, I, I know what the generic meaning of the word is, but what happens is when a president wants to be able to create policies and force them on Americans, they will have various federal departments write what's called guidance. In fact, that's how we got the transgender bathroom nonsense that came about during Barack Obama, because Obama couldn't get a law like that passed in Congress. So what he did was he had the Department of Education, which controls a relatively small amount of money that goes to American schools. I I do get phone calls from people who say, well, you know, the federal government, they're funding the schools. In most cases, your local schools are 90% or greater funded by local taxes, and the decisions about how to spend that money are made by either your local school board or your state legislature. The federal government, in some cases, may pay up to 10% of the cost of the local education that's done, K-12 through education in your community. But that's only 10%. Now, I will tell you, 10% can be very significant. If you've got a school district that, say, spends half a billion, $500 million a year, and $50 million of that comes from Washington, D.C., they tend to pay close attention to what Washington, D.C. tells them. Because if they were to lose that, say, $50 million, or if you had a very small school district, say, $50 million in your school district budget, and five of it comes from Washington, D.C., they're still going to pay attention even though it's only about 10%. Well, the Department of Education, under Joe Biden, it's an executive branch agency, has determined that under the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, this is an act through Congress, school hunting and archery classes are precluded from receiving federal funding. I think that's crazy. Now, when I went to high school, we didn't have a shooting program. They did teach Hunter's Ed uh, after hours as an extracurricular activity. We had no archery program at Tillamook High School. I'm a proud cheese maker, by the way, for those of you in Wisconsin. Um, But I wish we had. And in fact, if any school had one of those programs today to teach kids about guns, about archery, about bow hunting, uh, about any of that, I think of that as a positive. It doesn't mean that every kid will get involved in it, just like not every kid gets involved in football or basketball or baseball or volleyball or anything else. But if it's available, then you can actually cater to the needs of that child. And frankly, I think it's much more likely that if you engaged in archery, rifle, or hunting programs in high school, that when you're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, you're still going to be doing it decades later. Now, what's the likelihood that you're still going to be playing tackle football in your 30s, 40s, 50s, or 60s? Not nearly as likely at all. But the uh, in June of last year, the uh, Bipartisan Safety Communities Act, as it was called, was passed with large majorities in the House and the Senate before President Biden signed it and made it a law. It sought to promote safer, more inclusive, and positive school environments. I don't see how that does not include a hunting program, a rifle program, or an archery program. The legislation included an amendment that prohibited the money from the program from helping provide any person with a dangerous weapon or to provide training in the use of a dangerous weapon. Well, heck, that could apply to home ec. I mean, I I might be more concerned about uh, somebody with a large kitchen cleaver than I would if somebody was actually trained in the proper and safe use of firearms or a bow. Ben Cassidy, who is executive vice president for intergovernmental affairs at Safari Club International, I happen to be a member of the group, but he told Fox News Digital, at best, the department's policy appeared to be singularly geared to ensure hunters are less safe when handling firearms or bows, and at worst, it's leveling a direct attack on the hunter's ability to pass down hunting to new generations. Imagine this, your son or your daughter, and believe me, I hear from lots of moms and dads who say how proud they are that their son or daughter, and a lot of daughters do this as well, engage in trap shooting, inv- inv- engage in archery, Uh, on a range, or engage in bow hunting, or rifle and hunting. And all of this is apparently off limits because it's training a person with a dangerous weapon. Well, tell you what, a javelin can be dangerous, a shot put can be dangerous, but for whatever reason, Biden administration, through this new ESEA or BSCA bill, 
is telling schools, if you have an archery program, you can't have any of the money. If you have a rifle program, you can't have any of the money because you're not a safe school. Frankly, it has always confounded me that when you talk to educators and do this with one of your teacher friends or acquaintances, ask them, what do you think is the solution to, say, unintended pregnancy? And they'll tell you, well, education. And if you say, what about the problem of drug addiction? And they'll say, wow, that's education. You have to educate those kids. How about drinking alcohol? And they say, well, you need to educate kids about the dangers, the hazards, and, you know, the where's and why for's, because you, you know that those kids, when they turn 21, are going to be legally able to buy booze. And if, you, if they're going to consume it, they should know something about it. So with virtually every subject under the sun, if you ask teachers, if there's a problem associated with unintended pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, if there's a problem with uh, drug addiction, with alcohol addiction, if there's a problem with any of those things, bullying or anything like that, educators will uniformly tell you the answer to that problem is proper education. Do all those. Ask them about all those problems. They'll always answer education. Then say, what do you think is the solution to the problem of kids who get their hands on a gun and either they get hurt or somebody else gets hurt? And they won't say it this way, but their answer is ignorance. We should keep them ignorant about bows and arrows and rifles and pistols. And if you ask them, how does that square up? How does it make sense that if you told me that education is the answer to all those other problematic things, I mean, after all, you're not saying that when a kid graduates high school, he might not go out and engage in sexual activity. How do you make sure they're safe from sexually transmitted diseases or from an unintended pregnancy happening? You say, well, you got to educate them. You got to tell them what's going on. You got to tell them how it works. And then when it comes to guns, the opposite is true, according to teachers, at least the teachers who follow the woke nonsense. Now, the sensible teachers out there, they'll say otherwise. Oh, by the way, this email. Lars, I retired from the Air Force, served 28 years, and the time I was in, there was equality for all. At least in the Air Force, one would do your duty, study for promotions. All were recognized for their extra duties, like volunteering for the community and base service. I know of one case where a young officer was discriminated against due to his ethnic background, was passed over for promotion. He was discharged, he appealed, and within one year, he proved his case and was retroactively promoted to captain and given all his back pay. I ran into him a few years ago. He was a lieutenant colonel, and he was doing a great job. So everyone is given the opportunity to move up, and equity has nothing to do with it. Thanks very much for that email. Send those emails to talk at LarsLarson.com. We'll talk about the spike in diesel prices next. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. Joe Biden's war on American energy, and there's no doubt he has waged one since literally day one of his presidency, now more than two and a half years ago, has caused diesel fuel prices to skyrocket. How much worse is it going to get? And whether or not, the uh, question is whether or not we can do anything to fix it. Mike Kucharski joins me now, who's owner of JKC Trucking. Mike, welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me on your show again. So I have one uh, one vehicle in the family that runs on gasoline. The other one runs on diesel. So I tend to pay attention to diesel prices. And they have now, on average, surpassed $4 a gallon in the United States uh, uh, once again. And they're headed up again. What's this doing to your industry? You know, it, it's doing a lot. You know, diesel is the single largest cost burden incurred by truckers. You know, skyrocketing diesel fuel, hitting record highs, obviously, since 2008, while, while most of Americans do not fuel up with diesel, as you said, we are still affected at a supermarket at any delivery. You know, just to give you an idea, 70, 70, 70 to 72% of all goods are moved by trucks. There's a, a total of 1.8 million big rig drivers. You know, fuel, fuel is typically a trucking company's second largest operating expense after, after labor. So diesel is, is essential to the supply chain. You know, just to give you an idea, all big rigs, run on diesel, yep. including farm equipment, cargo trains, cargo ships, uh, cargo ships that transport fuel, and even the refrigeration, refrigeration units that we use on the front of the trailer to cool the product and keep it frozen that we, that, that we haul. You know, so the skyrocketing diesel fuel is affecting pricing of everything from food, produce, and, and everything moved by trucks. So, and, and not just that, the food moved by trucks, but as you pointed out, the farmers 
There isn't much uh, large-scale farming in America done at all without uh, petrochemical fertilizers, without, uh, without uh, tractors and combines and everything else. So if you think we're going to be able to eat without having fuel at a reasonable price, and when it is an unreasonable price, I, I don't think it's unfair at all for the farmers to say, well, price of diesel goes right into what we sell. And, and, then, and so before it ever hits the truck to take it to the grocery store, it's already got a lot of diesel in it. Yeah, so, I mean, the farmers are passing the buck along. Us carriers, we're, we're passing the cost. And all these extra costs, you know, roll down to the end user, the American people, and hit them right in the pocket. And that's not right. So what do you say about the fact that Joe Biden last year went out and, and, and really emptied the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to a large degree by just saying, okay, we have an emergency, and he dumped a whole bunch of crude out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve at that had been purchased at relatively lower costs, and it hasn't been refilled yet, although they're starting to do it now. So he created a little bit of a surplus last year that might have affected prices by a nickel or two. Uh, and now they're refilling the reserve, but since fuel's already short, refilling it is causing the prices to go up at the pump again. Yeah, so what happened by him using this reserve is, is like putting a, a Band-Aid on a, on a bullet wound. You know, you, you, he, he did it to, to help with the, 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 the high cost to dumping our reserve in, but that was just a temporary fix. You know, the, the biggest issue that I see, I mean, like how the, America needs to become energy independent again, which we were, and then now we are not. And then, of course, here comes the war from Ukraine. We're uh, banning uh, Russian fuel, all this, et cetera. And obviously, let's not forget, we're, this is still part of the aftermath of, of, of COVID. We're still feeling the effects because we had the, the high demand. Now demand has fallen, and we're waiting for it to, uh, what do they come and say, you know, uh, reset. And, you know, that's not going to, that might be till next year. It might be two years from now. Who knows? And we might have a national emergency in the meantime. It could be a war. It could be a weather emergency. It could be refining problems. I guess, Mike, I tend to think of that strategic petroleum reserve more like a family's uh, emergency bank account. And if dad says, hey, we're running short last fall. And he says, we're running short of money to maintain our lifestyle. So the family is going to pull down its bank account, its emergency account, to the lowest level it's been, in the case of the SPR, uh, to its lowest level in 40 years. And if the family says, well, Dad, what are you going to do when you get it you know, that low? He says, well, next year we'll have to fill it up again. If the family was short of money last fall and they took money out of their savings account to tie, you know, tide them through, and they say, but next year when we're still short of money, Dad, you're now going to take some of the money we're short of and use it to refill the bank account? Then you make the family even shorter than they were. And it sounds like that's what he's doing to trucking right now. I mean, that, that is it's a pretty good example. Yeah, that is essentially what, what, what has happened. You know, I mean, I, my, my understanding of this extra reserve was for a pandemic, you know, extreme weather, war, uh, et cetera, you know, acts of God. Uh, and... It was used to kind of, uh, like I said, you know, plug a, a bullet hole, and it, it, this is just a temporary fix. And, and, and you're right; in the long run, this is going to make it, you know, worse uh, for for all the people and, and the truckers. And tr- and chances are they aren't going to refill it as fast as they emptied it, are they? So this effect of buying fuel and then dumping it in the strategic petroleum reserve is going to go on a lot longer than the good effect went on last fall or last year. You know, I'm not familiar how much fuel they had in, in reserve and, and how much they dumped, but, yeah, I, I don't see it happening, you know, in the next re- refilling this reserve is going to take years. So what are your truck uh, drivers going to do? Because, because they're in trouble, aren't they? Yeah, it'd be, we're, there's, there's still fuel available. One thing that has happened because the, one thing that we're seeing right now is, is volume volatility. And what, what, what that means is, you know, everything's become so expensive. The cost of living, you know, the cost of cars, fuel, et cetera. And, and of course, the groceries at the, at the store, which are ridiculous. Now people have to change their diet because they only have so much money. They have to, you know, pay their bills, pay the electricity, pay the rent, et cetera. So they don't have as much surplus uh, money as they, as they used to. So now they have to change their diet. And when they change their diet, this caused the volume of, of food 
to drop because people were not buying it. If there's, they're not buying it, we're, they're not going to make it. And that even hurts truckers even further because now there's less work. And what happens when, when the demand goes down, the price goes down. And the, the products that we haul go to, go to the lowest bidder, which, which even hurts us even more because now we're paying you know, high fuel, all our costs are skyrocketing. And now we have to deal with another storm that this, this, this fuel uh, well, it kind of leaves you in a spot because the trucker is paying the higher yeah. food costs himself. He's paying the higher rent. He's paying higher utility bills. And he's finding out his paycheck is smaller because more of it's going into the tank to buy the fuel that keeps him rolling down the road. Mike, thanks so much. I appreciate the time. Thank you for having me on your show. You bet. That's Mike Kucharski, who's the owner of JKC Trucking. We check in with him from time to time to find out what's going on, and it ain't good news right now. Diesel prices on July 31st went past 4 bucks a gallon again, and it's still on the way up. Glad to get your calls at 866-HEY-LARS. Send your emails to talk at LarsLarson.com and tell Alexa to play the Lars Larson Show. The one thing that Trump is fearful of uh, when it comes to his being president is that finally we will see how illegitimate his victory actually was. That is Hillary Clinton, of course, two-time presidential loser, declaring the 2016 election of President Donald Trump illegitimate. Now, that's something that a lot of Democrats do all the time. In fact, let me give you some of the numbers and the facts before I get to talking about the indictment of Donald Trump yesterday for free speech. Believe it or not, he's being indicted four times under federal law for engaging in free speech. And I'll explain And I'll kind of expect I'm going to get some naysayer calls today. But first, welcome to the Lars Larson Show. Glad to have you on board and always glad to take your calls at 866-HEY-LARS. That's 866-439-5277. And if you happen to be a naysayer, that is you disagree with me. And as I said, I kind of expect a few of you may disagree with me about the latest indictments of President Trump. But If you want to join the conversation, you certainly can. Send an email to talk at LarsLarson.com and vote in my Twitter poll. You can find the daily question every single weekday at Lars Larson Show on Twitter and LarsLarson.com on the web. But about what Democrats do in denying elections, which apparently... When the Democrats do it, it's perfectly okay. In fact, it's uh, it's expected of them. But when Republicans do it, well, they might actually try to turn you into a criminal. But many Democrats, Hillary Clinton, Barbara Lee, Maxine Waters, Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas, they have cast doubt on every single Republican presidential victory over the last two decades. 20 years of this stuff. And they have called every single election of a Republican illegitimate. And I'll tell you this, you may not have thought of this. Every single Democrat president since 1977 has cast doubt on the legitimacy of U.S. elections. That includes uh, Jimmy Carter. That includes Barack Obama. And, of course, it includes Joe Biden. The problem is the Democrats still lose. And now they're literally trying to block President Donald Trump, who represents such a threat to the Democrat Party and its candidates that they don't want Americans to even have the chance to vote for him. So they have designs to knock him out before he even gets a chance to run. I think this suggests that the Democrats know when he gets the nomination next summer from the GOP and then runs in the November election, he's going to win. America's government under Joe Biden has decided if it can't control the candidates, if it can't control the news stories on social media, and believe me, the Biden administration has been trying to control the information that you see and hear on social media and on the major networks, they've tried to do it and they've failed. They've even been in court asking judges, will you give us the right to control free speech? Well, then they will prosecute the speech itself. The latest indictments against President Trump that came down late yesterday afternoon, now numbering more than 80 of them, believe it or not, charge him with questioning the results of the 2020 election. Now, if your reaction to that was the same as mine, well, he's engaging in free speech. He's asking the same kind of questions that knucklehead Lars asks on the radio all the time. Do you believe the results of the election? If you don't, you can say so. It's still America. There's still a First Amendment. The government can't tell you what to say. Not yet. 
Well, now you know that no Democrat ever gets punished for questioning the results of an election because they've done a lot of it. In fact, I've given you a little sample to listen to right here. John Lewis is completely right. There is a cloud of illegitimacy around the election of Donald Trump. The Russians interfered with his election. James Comey and the FBI interfered with his election. Uh, election. The fake news industry interfered with his election. Trump knows he's an illegitimate president who got illegitimate foreign help. Do you believe Trump is illegitimate president? What I believe is that there's no question that the outcome of this election was affected by the Russian interference. Uh, there absolutely is a cloud of illegitimacy. So that legitimacy is in question, yes. Yeah, I read the indictment very carefully last night. This piece of garbage from Jack Smith, the guy who's doing the work of Merrick uh, Merrick Garland at the Department of Justice. I read that indictment cover to cover, and I read it very carefully. And it explains that Trump stands guilty of lying. Now, I don't know about you, but the garden variety definition of lying is when you say something that you know isn't true. Now, all of us have said things and then found out later we were wrong. That's not a lie. It's only a lie when you say something and then later on you find out it's not true. Only a lot of us have seen the evidence and we've talked about the fraud of the 2020 election. President Trump cited part of it on that January 6th speech in 2021 when he demanded the right to have all the votes counted, which strangely enough, Jack Smith in the indictment says Americans have the right to have all the votes counted. Let me read a quote from Trump on January 6, 2021. In Pennsylvania, you had 205,000 more votes cast than you had voters to cast them. Now, apparently saying that out loud is a crime, but only if you're a candidate who's running against Joe Biden. For Democrats, the rules are very, very different. As I've showed you, I've got literally dozens of minutes of sound bites of big deal Democrats calling the 2016 election illegitimate, stolen, and the result of Russian interference. All of that turns out to be lies. But you're not going to see the Joe Biden DOJ charging Hillary, Jimmy, Kamala, or Joe with criminal free speech. Can you believe it? We've arrived at the day in America where you, it can be a crime to engage in free speech. And if I, when I read the indictment last night, This was one of the most amazing things because Jack Smith makes the case. Donald Trump knowingly lied. As I said, that's when you tell somebody something that you know to be untrue. And then you wonder in the indictment, how is it they know Donald Trump was saying things he knew wasn't true? Do you know what Jack Smith argues in that indictment? I mean, this is four brand new federal crimes he's saying Donald Trump committed. He says Donald Trump knew it was a lie because there were people in the government who told him it wasn't true. I got news for you, Jack. Most of us who've been paying attention for the last three years or so, we understand the government tells us stuff all the time that is a lie uh, or not true, turns out to be not true later. Like when Joe Biden said late in 2022, if you get the COVID shot, you can't get COVID. Well, that's a lie. He also said wearing masks protects you. That's a lie. I mean, we could go right down the string of lies. Go back to the summer of 2021, six months into Joe Biden's presidency. People were asking, reporters were saying to him, what about the rising cost of gasoline and diesel? And Joe Biden told them over and over again, oh, it's only going to be a small amount of inflation. It's only going to be temporary. Well, apparently temporary has a different definition in Joe Biden's vocabulary because the price of gas is still about 50 percent higher today than it was two and a half years ago when Joe Biden took the oath of office. The fact is Joe Biden acts like he's running a banana republic. He spends literally 40 percent of his presidency on the beach. And if anybody dares challenge him, then like in any good dictatorship, you simply throw your opponent in prison. Is that really the America you want? Glad to be with you on a Wednesday. Always glad to take your calls. Pleasure to be with you. And if you want to join the best conversation in talk journalism, it's easy. 866-HEY-LARS. And naysayers go to the head of the line at 866-439-5277. You can vote in our Twitter poll, at Lars Larson Show. And you're listening to the Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. It's a pleasure to be with you. And you know I've got a dog in the fight on this one. I uh, have had a concealed carry permit now for 
what is it, uh, over 25 years, and I rarely leave the house without a gun. I mean, if I'm going to the airport or a federal building, I kind of have to because I can't get away with that. And there seem to be more people suggesting more limits from the left, saying you shouldn't be able to carry a gun, you shouldn't be able to own a gun, we're going to limit the kind of gun you can have and everything else. One of the other phenomena I notice, and we talk about it on this show a lot, is when people become the subject of of uh, any kind of violence, whether it's domestic violence or or just crime that occurs in their community, you always hear not just the police, but community groups saying, we're going to have to prepare people better to help make sure that they stay safe. And I always see lots of advice, uh, keep your head on a swivel and things like that. But what I don't hear, and you ought to be carrying a gun. Now, there are some, you know, police and sheriff's departments in some parts of America that would give you that advice all day long. But a lot, a lot of the other places, they'll, they'll talk about, we've got to stop this from happening. Okay, arrest more bad guys. Well, we don't want to do that. Well, how, don't you, how about advising people uh, who might find themselves in a tough situation to be capable of defending themselves? No, they don't seem to want to do that either. And I imagine that Carrie Sloan knows all about that, founder of We the Female and the executive director of the Education Crime Research Prevention Center, the Crime uh, Prevention Research Center, where I serve in an unpaid position on the board. Carrie, welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me on. So you wrote about this situation that happened, uh, well, it just happened a couple of weeks ago, and it was in, in July where Lance Logan murdered 64-year-old Carolyn Williams in Hartford, Connecticut. And she was literally on the phone with 911, calling for help. And he also beat her 30-year-old son. He's now facing charges of murder, assault in the second degree, and everything else, which doesn't do uh, Carolyn Williams any good at all. And and yet, did did local authorities say, well, she should have had a gun? No, in fact, uh, he was already a prohibited person for uh, several charges uh that he had been let out of jail for, bailed out or what have you, um, prior to that and was actually a prohibited person. And weird how a prohibited person was able to, uh, you know, obtain a gun, right? I mean, that's not supposed to happen. So <clears throat> you already had this case where, you know, he, he was already uh, had a restraining order against him, yep. uh, therefore a re- prohibited person, and he was still able to obtain a firearm. And then he murdered this this woman, um, you know, while she was on on the phone waiting for help to show up. And, you know, sadly, that's not the only case of that. There was just another one a couple of weeks ago in Chesapeake where the same thing happened. And only in that case, the man showed who was prohibited showed up with a gun and his excuse for showing up with a gun to break the restraining order was, well, she had a gun and was going to kill me. You mean for being where you weren't supposed to be, you know, so these are, this is, this is happens a lot more than people realize. Well, and and I guess what I wonder about, is when I hear all these people say, we're going to have all these programs, you know, and they talk about every solution in the world, all of them lesser solutions to becoming a victim of a violent crime, except the one that would actually have been a game changer. I mean, uh, would, uh, you th- would you be willing to say that if 64-year-old Carolyn Williams, I don't know how, you know, she was a, a strong woman or a you know, tall woman or a, a big woman, but, but no matter how big she was, if her, if her, uh, her friend, you know, her, her uh, ex-husband, was um, you know was uh, the, the man who beat her um, that that if he was armed and she wasn't there was nothing that would have equalized that situation short of a firearm was there uh, not not if you if you find something uh, Lars that I don't know about please let me know because as far as I know there is no better and effective self defense tool for a woman than a firearm and, and in fact a deter- a, 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 well and you even made the case that there's a deterrent to it. That if the bad guys all say, well, I brought a gun because she had a, gr- a, a gun, at least it might bring you up to somewhat equal standing. But if the bad guy knows he's got a gun and he knows because he knows her well, uh, knows that the victim doesn't have a gun, then then he knows he's got the edge all day long. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, and even, you know, obviously in this case, it did not end well for Carolyn, but even you know showing up with it is an intimidation factor and and that's an that's abuse in itself you know well, you can use it to threaten or intimidate with see you raised the question and i've raised this a number of times with law enforcement agencies that say we really are concerned about protecting especially those people like her who already know that somebody is threatening her and they've said stay away and the courts have said stay away but how many of the police agencies in america actually also say to them you need to buy a gun you need to have a gun available. You need to go to the range and train, maybe even get some professional training. But at the very least, 
you know, make sure that you have a way of protecting yourself. I get the impression that an awful lot of cops don't give that advice to people who are already in a, pot- a potentially dangerous situation like she is or was. Yeah, yeah. through my organization, We the Female, I've you know, had the opportunity to talk to victims and survivors of abuse. And I'm, a, I'm an abuse survivor myself from Washington State. And I, I know that um, there have been women that are told, but it's very, very few and far between. And they're obviously in counties that are very rural in red states. Um, I know I personally, as I stood in front of the law enforcement, the Kitsap County Sheriff's uh, deputies, uh, when my bruised with fingerprints around my neck from being picked up across, from my throat and thrown across the room, the uh, deputies told me to hide for four or five days because the, the chances of violence were going to escalate once he was arraigned because obviously I'm at fault for putting him in jail. Um, and they never told me to even find any way to defend myself. They just told me to hide from him in a place that he couldn't find me. So if you went back to those deputies today, uh, do you think they've changed their tune with domestic violence uh, p- potential victims or act- uh, previous victims and, and changed their advice? Absolutely not, especially in Kitsap County, where the the narrative to make a woman a martyr, uh, an abuse victim a martyr um, for more gun control has, has actually spread in the past 15 years as opposed to... Um, you know, going the opposite direction and, and helping women embrace self-defense is, is rampant. I mean, you know, we see the Seattle spread of that, that policy and that culture. Uh, violence culture is spread out all over the state. Um, and so I absolutely do not think that they have changed their tune. I think that, in fact, they've doubled down on their, their take to make women victims. So what do you think would, it would take from the public to get a change in that, especially I've always said, Carrie, that I I like the idea of sheriffs because they're directly elected and directly answerable to the public. Police chiefs, not so much. They answer to politicians. Mm -hmm. But if the public said we're not electing any sheriff who's not willing to advise women, especially women who've already been the victim of domestic violence, uh, to get the capability to protect themselves. Now, they wouldn't force it on them. They're not going to say you have to. They say we really strongly advise you get a pistol and have it and know how to shoot it. Well, I, I think that I, I obviously that is where the power lies, you know, and, and we could talk all day about <clears throat> the fact that where you can actually affect changes in your city and, and counties in particular, and the sheriff being one of them, but you have to be able to get a candidate up there who's willing to, uh, you know, put forward that constitutional stance. And that in itself is becoming more difficult in counties across the country where you're now seeing uh, sheriffs who do not um, uphold the constitution. So the, the, it really lies in being able to find those viable candidates first, and that that's an even bigger challenge. Well, see, I think it'd be worth it, it for voters to go to these candidates and say, do you support domestic vi- advising domestic violence survivors to get a gun? And if they say no, you say, well, why not? But, Carrie, I appreciate well, you coming on the program. you got to check out what she does at the Crime Prevention Research Center. She's also executive director for education, and she's the founder of We the Female. What if you could help turn back the clock and help your dog play like a puppy again, no matter their age? It's Lars, and it sure works for Sir Winston Churchill, my Bernese mountain dog. That's why Dr. Marty developed Nature's Blend, because your dog needs a diet full of real cuts of meat, similar to what they'd eat in the wild. Dogs go bonkers for Nature's Blend. When given the choice between Nature's Blend and the giant online retailer's number one bestseller in dry dog food, a study shows 29 out of 30 dogs choose Nature's Blend first. Tori from Tulsa says, my fur baby is so eager to eat it. Other dog foods I've tried gave my sweet boy issues with allergies. They all went away with Dr. Marty's and Nature's Blend. Give your dog a food they'll love and help support their youthful energy, healthy skin, easy digestion, and a happy full life. For a limited time, claim 54% off Nature's Blend and get a free pack of premium dog treats from Dr. Marty Pets. Go to drmartypets.com slash pets or text pets to 511-511. That's text pets to 511-511. Study available on request. Message and data rates apply. Glad to have you with me. You're listening to The Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to The Lars Larson Show. You hear us on this program talking about, and me, about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You hear us talking about uh, racial equity and implicit bias and things like that. But has it ever occurred to you that that might actually be dangerous? 
I want to give you one case in point, and I'll get back to your phone calls and emails at 866-HEY-LARS. That's 866-439-5277. Send your emails to talk at LarsLarson.com. And join me in welcoming Caleb Trotter, who's an attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation. We talk to PLF on a regular basis because they represent some great clients, uh, but we only do it be, uh, out of the goodness of our heart because, man, because uh, PLF is a good organization. Caleb, welcome back. Thanks, Lars. Can you tell me about Dr. Azadeh Kata- is it Ka- Katibi? Is that the way you say it? Katibi, yes. Katibi. Tell me about her. She's a medical yes. doctor, right? Yes, uh, happy to. Dr. Katibi is, a, is an Iranian immigrant. Her, her family fled Tehran when she was a child in the late 70s. They, uh, they wound up settling in Los Angeles. Um, she per- wound up um, in American schools in, in Southern California. It turned out that she was um, quite brilliant. She got medical degree. She went to undergraduate at UCLA, then got um, a medical degree. Oh, I think we just dropped. Hold on a second. Let's uh, Donovan see if we can get Don- Caleb back because I think that line just dropped. May- Cell phones have been terrible. I don't know if it's sun interference or what, but we'll see if we can get uh, Caleb back on. But uh, this doctor, I can tell you this. I know about Dr. Katibi. Uh, I don't know her personally, but she be, decided to become an ophthalmology specialist, an eye doctor. And, uh, and the problem is California lawmakers decided that they would have a brand new mandate when it came to race and ethnicity and things like that. Caleb, welcome back. You, uh, somehow the system cut you off in the middle. Uh, tell me again, Dr. Katibi. So she becomes a medical doctor, an eye doctor. And then what happened? Exactly. And uh, as a part of her her medical practice. She also uh, enjoys and, and regularly uh, teaches continuing education courses. One of the, the licensure requirements for medical doctors, as well as attorneys like me, is on a regular basis, you have to continue taking continuing education. And that's one thing that she does. She teaches courses on um, ophthalmology and other things in the medical profession. Well, a couple years ago, uh, the California legislature decided that they would require all continuing medical education courses to include discussion of implicit bias. Now, this isn't just a, hey, you know, this is something to be careful, look out for, something along those lines that, you know, anybody could just throw in at the last minute and move on just to comply. It requires the, the instructors to actually give examples of how this has occurred and strategies to counteract it. So it, it involves a pretty in-depth discussion and uh, engagement with, with the concept. And the only problem is that the evidence is mixed that um, implicit bias is, is really a thing and that leads to disparate healthcare outcomes in the first place. Um, there's also mixed evidence that trainings like that are actually effective. And, and there's actually evidence that these trainings are instead uh, counterproductive and can create um, distrust and resentment, not just among physicians taking these trainings, but c- it can also spill over to their own patients. Because if, if the trainings are effectively saying, all physicians, you're racist, then what are their patients to think? So um, this this is a, you know, a very controversial topic. Well, Caleb, not all at- uh, I, yeah, I want ahead, my sir. audience to really understand this, because I think this is such hocus pocus, you can't believe it. But they explain, and you've explained, that implicit bias is where a medical professional, doctor, nurse, whatever, uh, treats a patient differently based on their race or their other immutable characteristics, disability or whatever, but they do it unconsciously. They don't know they're doing it. So that somehow, I guess a white doctor walks into the room and there's a black female patient and he treats her differently without him, without realizing himself that he's doing it. How in the world do you detect something that the doctor can't detect? that the person who's doing it allegedly can't figure out. Right. The The name of the test escapes me at the moment, but the, it's available online, and it's usually kind of the, the crown jewel of these trainings where you, you take this test and it measures the speed at which you determine your preference for one thing or another, one person or another, and based on how quickly you click a mouse, it will provide a result that says, oh, you might be implicitly biased towards such and such kind of person. And 
aside from that being a, a very controversial at best way of testing this, there are, of, of course, studies showing its, its dubious effectiveness and, and reliability. And that's really the, the, the most common means of um, determining the extent or the existence of such implicit bias. And I think it's obvious uh, the, the problems of such a method. Well, so if, if, I mean, in a training, if you walk into a bunch of, to a doctor or a bunch of doctors and say, you know, you don't realize it, but you're all white men or you're all uh, African-American women. Okay, whatever you are, you're all treating people of other races or other genders or other sexual preference, whatever the group is. You're all treating them wrong and you're implicitly biased against them. If you don't realize you're doing it, uh, how, how do you correct that if it's something that ought to be corrected? Yeah, I, I don't know, Lars. <laughs> That's a good question. I, and, and because it's unclear, um, by the state requiring every single um, instructor of continuing medical education to, to try and attempt this, at, at, first of all, they're unqualified to do. Let's just assume there is a way to do it. Well, the state provides no training and instruction to the instructors on how to do this. Um, and so that's just another one of the problems with this being required to be included in every single continuing med medical education course with, with very few exceptions. So it could be a, a course you know, just simply describing a, a newly discovered eye disease and, and ways of treating it that uh, aren't different based on um, who the person is. This is a disease in an eye. This is how you treat it. And then they've got to provide time in this training to discuss something that might be completely irrelevant about uh, implicit bias, but the instructor has no way of, of doing it. And so even if there um, was a, you know, a, a universally accepted way of doing these trainings um, by, by requiring all these instructors to do it, it it's, it's a problem of effectiveness, assuming it could be effective. But, but the constitutional problem here is, is that it's compelling all of these instructors to engage in the state's preferred instruction and, and the viewpoint and accepting that this is a concept and, and a way to, to address it. And, and that's why we got involved and that's why our clients, Dr. Katibi, we also represent a Los Angeles anesthesiologist, Dr. Singleton, and um, they object to having to include this training because of um, being co-opted into the state's views on it and not being able to, even if they decided it was relevant for a given topic they were teaching on, they would want to do it with a, a lot more nuance and specificity than they are able to, um, given the state uh, mandate. And Caleb, it also sounds like it's the government telling you, we will tell you not only what to say, but how to say it to different groups of people based on their racial, sexual, whatever characteristics, that this is forced speech by the state to say, you have to say it the way we tell you to say it. And if you don't, we'll take your medical ticket away. I'm glad you're fighting that fight. That's Caleb Trotter. He's an attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation. We'll get to your phone calls and emails in a moment at 866-HEY-LARS. That's 866-439-5277. You're listening to The Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to The Lars Larson Show. What happens when one of the major liberal media in America, The Washington Post, decides to tell a story in support of abortion? or as the liberals like to call it, abortion rights, even though there is no such thing. Uh, and then it turns around and bites them in the backside. I want to tell you about that story in a moment. First, welcome to the Lars Larson Show. It's a pleasure to be with you and always glad to get your phone calls and your emails. And we'll get to the Trump indictment maybe a little bit later. But I got to tell you about this because I love it when the mainstream media, which is so reliably liberal all day long and twice on Sunday, when they get bit in the backside by their own story. If you want to join the best conversation in talk journalism, it's here every day at 866-HEY-LARS. That's 866-439-5277. Send your emails to talk at LarsLarson.com. Then after I tell you about the, the WAPO and how they got bit by their own story, uh, I'll get to your calls right after that. But here's what happened. 
So just over a year ago, as we were heading up to June, June of last year, when the Supreme Court finally released its decision in what's called the Dobbs decision, that's the one that kicked Roe v. Wade properly to the curb because they said, we've looked at the Constitution. There ain't no right to abortion in that Constitution anywhere. So they decided the Dobbs decision. But before that, the Washington Post thought, we're going to do a story and talk about the tragedy when a young couple is not able to kill their own baby. You know, so they did this story about this this, uh, pair of teenagers, Brooke and Billy High. Now, you might notice they have the same last name now. That's not because they're brother and sister. They are, in fact, husband and wife. But let me get to that in just a moment. So Brooke and Billy High, they met at a skate park. Uh, There was a quick romance like there is when you're a young teenager. And uh, the usual things happen. I don't need to give you the birds and bees speech. And she became pregnant. And, uh, and they said, what are we going to do? And the problem was she apparently didn't realize she was pregnant until three months in. And by that time, the state of Texas had, I think, wisely passed a law saying you can't do an abortion on a baby where the doctor can actually hear the heartbeat, which happens about six or seven weeks into uh, pregnancy after conception. So what did they do? Well, they said it would have been inconvenient to drive 16 miles to New Mexico and get an abortion. So she had the baby. And you know what else they did? I mean, you're going to be amazed by this. They got married. And it wasn't just one baby she had. She had twin girls. And I've seen them. They look beautiful. I mean, they were in the Washington Post story. And you know what? You know what Billy did? Billy married her. And then he said, I got to have an income to support my family. So he signed up for the U.S. military and he became a mechanic for the Air Force. Now, the story didn't say whether he works on airplanes or whether he works on, on uh, trucks and cars. But either way, he's getting the kind of skills that when he leaves the military, maybe he'll stay for a 20-year hitch. Maybe he'll get out after an enlistment and he'll go out in the civilian sector. Do you think those skills will do him any good? So a year later, the Washington Post this week did an update on the story. And they said, look at this. What's happened now? Well, they went ahead and ha- had twin baby girls, a double blessing. Uh, who are, by all accounts, healthy and happy. Dad gets a $60,000 a year job working, serving in uniform for the U.S. military, and mom stays home with the girls. Oh, my God. I'm sure progressives all over America are aghast at this. You mean they got married? Well, marriage is not a thing anymore. They had a baby instead of aborting it because the baby or babies, in this case, were inconvenient. Dad went out and got a job and works hard to support his family, and mom stayed home with the kids? Why, that's horrible. Oh, the humanity. I mean, the Washington Post, which I think had set out to show how disastrous a ban on abortion or even a limitation on abortion like Texas had, uh, that, that how disastrous it would be for this teenage couple. And instead, they end up doing a story about how wonderful life is. That they have a young couple, and they do they do spend a lot of time in the in the story talking about how this is a young couple who occasionally have disagreements. Wow, you know, shocker. Uh, welcome to the real world. Young couples who get in arguments sometimes in a brand new marriage when they've got kids and a job and everything else. But by all accounts, mom and dad are happy. The little girls are happy. Four people are alive instead of just two. Dad has a good job. Mom gets a chance to spend all the time with the girls, and the Washington Post ends up providing one of the best arguments in favor of life that I've ever seen in a liberal newspaper. Tier calls at 866-HEY-LARS. Let's go first to J.C., who's a naysayer. Uh, J.C., you heard my argument about Donald Trump being prosecuted for engaging in free speech and skepticism about an election. Where do you and I disagree? Well, um, you claim it first, uh, First Amendment rights, right? Claim? Um, no, so, God gave me First Amendment rights. The U.S. Go- the Constitution says the U.S. government has no right messing with my God-given rights. That's what I would claim. Okay, so I can say anything I want on your radio show. No, 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 because no, the no, first... No. Am- can I tell you why, J.C.? Have you- sure. The, con- the Constitution is a set of limits on the government. It is not a limit on me. Do you understand that? So, yes. So, and, so and, I can tell ahead. you, J.C., we won't let you say that on the air... I ha- there's no limit on me from the Constitution. If the mayor or the governor or the president tells you, J.C., shut your mouth about whatever you're talking about, the, go- the government has no business telling you what to say or what not to say. Do we agree on that? 
sure. I, I can odd buy that. So um, okay. let me ask you this about, about so you agree that, that Trump lies in. No, I didn't think he lied at all. I think he was telling the truth. And I have, I have a lot of the same. I'm actually, almost every objection he has to the 2020 election, I have the same objection. Not because he had it, because I think the facts lead me to that. There's no proof, Lars. There's absolutely zero proof. It's been taken zero to court. Zero proof of what? That out. there were 200,000 uh, 200, more There's votes cast in Pennsylvania than there were voters they, to cast them? They went, they went back and checked it. And actually, I hate to say it, but Biden ended up, anytime you do a recount, for the most part, the, the person that won is going to end up with more votes. Look at the Al Gore it, at, in Florida. He well, so you're saying it's a fraudulent he, system. It's not a fraudulent system. It's not perfect. Hold on. If you There's just said whoever wins, whoever appears to win the election, when they recount, it always goes in their favor. Statistically, you're right. But let me ask you something, JC. A recount, right. I'm going to tell you, a recount doesn't prove jack. And let me tell you why. Can I give you my favorite metaphor for that? You might like it. You might not. Would you like to hear right. it? Yes. I, okay. I, Let's I, say I owed you $1,000. And one day I show up and I got an envelope. And I say, here's a thousand dollars that I owe you, JC, and you count it, and it comes up to a thousand. I say, count it a second time just to make sure there's a thousand dollars there, and you say, okay, and you count it a second time, and then I tell you, JC, some of those bills are counterfeit, and you say, well, uh, how, how many? And I said, I don't know, but some of them are counterfeit. Might be the whole thousand, might be five hundred bucks, might be fifty bucks. Some of them are counterfeit. If I tell well, you, you know, to count it. If I tell you to count it five more times, will it make any difference how many times you count it if some of the bills are counterfeit? Well, you know, here in Pendleton, you know what that would get you right between the eyes, right? Well, you would, but that's not the point I'm making, J.C. If you recount counterfeit bills, does it matter what the count comes up to if you know some or all of the bills are counterfeit? Well, if you're not only giving me counterfeit bills, you're going to get something between. Uh, okay, that's a different not- subject, and I know you can't answer the question, but I very much appreciate you at least trying. And you're listening to The Lars Larson Show.